What's up, speed tards? Welcome to episode 30 of Futurism Forever podcast. Today we're going to be discussing Blade Runner. Um, yeah, so should be good. Um, I'll introduce the panel. We have Dom here again. He was on the Crash episode and the Fight Club episode, so some of you should know him by now. But uh, what's up, Dom? Hey, everybody. I'm uh, really happy to, um, to be back. I'm happy. Uh... Uh, Gio was cool enough to invite me on the Blade Runner episode, and hopefully we could touch base uh, talking about the novel it's based on, written by Philip K. Dick in 1968, called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Yeah, it's Blade Runner and Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep. We're definitely going to be talking about Philip K. Dick and the book as well. Um I think like Philip K. Dick does like deserve his own episode at some point. So like the main episode is on like the main focus of the episode is going to be Blade Runner. But like we'll definitely touch on PKD mm -hmm. and uh, the book for sure. Jackson just popped up in the chat. Are, are you planning on like being on the panel for this episode or are you just listening? Yes, here? sir. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give you an introduction to this is Jackson's first time on the podcast. Um readers of the blog will uh remember him i published a couple of his poems and uh he recently wrote a critique on libertarianism that got a lot of traffic so yeah welcome to the podcast jackson do you want to introduce yourself to the ff audience who are hearing your voice for the first time yeah um i'm a philosophy student computer science student and uh i i just like i just write poems and shit okay cool um well it's good to have you on and uh yeah we might as well get started so blade runner was inspired by a book by philip k dick i think it came out in like the late 60s or early 70s dom do you 1968. know 1968 yeah it was 1968 okay um and yeah like this book uh do androids dream of electric sheep kind of kick-started the whole cyberpunk genre so we should start with that and give a brief description of what cyberpunk is so cyberpunk is a uh a subgenre of science fiction it usually revolves around um like dystopian futures um uh, as you see in blade runner um usually dealing with like totalitarian governments or like dystopian futures the corporations have more power than the uh than the uh governments um in this case the tyrell corporation which manufactures uh like uh replicants uh sort of more human than human they're robots they look like people but they aren't um so yeah do you want to give a, like a brief description of what uh do androids dream of electric sheep is all about dom <clears throat> well 
uh, well, basically, to cover what you said about cyberpunk, this actually goes into the novel by uh, PKD. So basically, do androids dream of electric sheep? It's kind of those, I consider it a midpoint between, well, the, the midpoint when it comes to the history of the creation of cyberpunk. In my opinion, you have like the classic movie Metropolis by Fritz Lang, then the Czechoslovakian play Rossum's Universal Robots, which are kind of proto cyberpunk when you think about it but pkd's book uh, androids basically is it basically starts the ball rolling quicker you have this idea that was popularized in the 80s following uh, the publication of neuromancer by william gibson which is the cyberpunk book that's when it was that was when it really came into its own this idea yeah, of high tech uh... high High tech. I, I, I want to throw in that, like, yeah, do androids dream of electric sheep is more like proto cyberpunk. Um, it yeah. kind of kick started it in the film version of Blade Runner, definitely too. But if I, if like we get to doing it like a cyberpunk episode in the future, it will be William Gibson and Neuro. Oh, for sure. 100%. But uh, this is kind of our first foray in that direction. Um, something else yeah, I wanted it's... to add in, like, the description of cyberpunk, like, the two main characteristics of cyberpunk are like high technology and low culture. So um, like you see in Blade Runner, like it will deal with like cybernetics, artificial intelligence, um, also like virtual realities. A lot of it is like revolves around hacker culture, though that's not super relevant to Blade Runner or do androids dream of electric sheep. It is to like Neuromancer and the genre of cyberpunk. But that, that like that's one thing like that I would say kind of makes do androids dream of electric sheep not really cyberpunk. It's more proto cyberpunk. Exactly. Like it doesn't have the virtual realities and uh, all that. Um, but yeah, anyway, sorry to cut you off. Uh, what were you? No, no, no it's fine. But exa exactly, you mentioned uh, what I what I mentioned pre previously, the hallmarks of cyberpunk are high tech, low life. But that's one thing that PKD really touches on in his most popular books and specifically in, in Androids. And this goes into what I discussed with you before um, before uh, uh, the chat. It's the setting of, of the novel compared to the setting of the movie. In the movie, it takes place in a futuristic version of, um, of Los Angeles, which looks, it's absolutely aesthetically phenomenal. We could thank the concept artist uh, Sid Mead for this. Heavily inspired by Fritz Lang's Metropolis. You get these towering buildings. People are crammed together like uh, ants and bees. It truly is a shock for uh, the eyes, right? But to go back on the low life, the movie is more high tech, low life, what we would imagine in a cyberpunk dystopia. Whereas the book, yes, there is a lot of high tech te technology. You have androids, but at the same and also flying cars. But at the same time, the general aesthetic is more low tech because it takes place in San Francisco. But to sort of really paint the image in your mind, in the book, just imagine if San Francisco had the bad luck of inner city Detroit and the outlying suburb areas uh, being laden with, um, with the radioactive dust, and you more or less get the image that PKD tries to paint in our mind. Yes, Deckard, the character, has a pretty nice uh, condominium he lives with with, with his wife. Uh, but that's in the more affluent areas that haven't been affected by atomic war. But generally speaking, if you want to have the image of what PKD wrote, uh, just imagine it, uh, 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 basically Detroit, but with flying cars. Yeah, the, the Earth has become like an uninhabitable Ooh. dead zone, pretty much. Like the atmosphere in both films is like oppressively bleak and like exactly seems very polluted. And they like Ridley Scott movie, it's always raining, which um like we're gonna get into that when we talk about like the movie itself, but um yeah. it's very much a neo-noir film, like in the classic sense, um at the same yeah. time. So it's kind of like archaeo futurist almost because it, it does have cues to like a lot of cinematic mm -hmm. traditions too which we will get into that when we talk about the movie itself. Um, 
Can we get right into it, or do you have more you want to talk about as far as Philip K. Well, Dick goes? I think we can well, spend more time on PKD himself, actually, because he's an interesting guy. Like, well, he, yeah. he's kind of like, um, he's kind of, he wasn't a beatnik exactly, but he kind of like existed in that milieu. Um, and like, he was friends with a lot of these people. Um, he kind of wrote science fiction to make money he loved science fiction and, and as a genre and stuff but like he did want to be like seen as like a serious <laughs> writer and at that time science fiction was not taken seriously at all it was in like little pulp magazines it was very niche and fringe it was not like popular by any stretch like he wrote those stories to like make money and stuff but he was always trying to write like more serious works and he wanted critical acclaim and all that, but like he's most known for his science fiction now, and he's like one of the most famous science fiction writers easily. But uh, yeah, um, he was also a lifelong speed addict, uh, which exactly. Was if there's anything we hear at F, F indoors, it's methamphetamine addiction. So <laughs> I'm just joking, I'm just joking, but uh, well, yeah, he, he was into that. Um, well, yeah, the thing about PKD, well, we could talk for hours about this guy. Uh, I'm going to just say say this. If you like um, uh, topics concerning dark artists, basically artists that have a lot of darkness in their lives and use their art as a way of, let's say, therapy, kind of, I suggest you you check out the Art of Dark podcast. They spoke about, P, uh, uh, about um, Philip K. Dick. But what I want to say about him is if you're a young person that wants to get into PKD's books, the best way I could describe him as a writer is, well, 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 well first things first, I jokingly call him a schizo because he did have some mental illnesses in which sometimes he wasn't sure if what was happening to him was real or not, or if he just imagined the whole thing. Then he also engaged in drug use. But concerning his books themselves, they're, they, people tend to deride them as being all over the place. Just imagine a human spine. You start at the bottom and work your way up. You have the general thrust of the story, then you have the ribcage. So he'll randomly throw in sci-fi concepts that don't really go anywhere. He's just world building for the sake of world building. But for a guy who started writing pulps and would eventually become a cult author in the 60s, 70s, and the early 80s, it kind of works. You know, he was writing at a time in which an author could just world build to his heart's content and the audience just stood there and took it. Tolkien is another fantastic example. He would write entire chapters that don't progress the story, but he grabs you by the balls and he's like, fuck it, we're going on a quest and you're just going to sit there and you're going to like it. <clears throat> Same thing with PKD. He would randomly throw in, in uh, the Android's book, uh, a mood organ type of machine that makes you depressed or makes you happy just because the world's so nihilistic. Once again, he'll randomly throw in a fake uh, TV-based religion. Does it really progress the plot? It kind of does. But, you know, PKD is like that. His books are like expressionist paintings. You can't really look at them up close. You have to take a step back before you understand, oh, these various threads all connect, albeit in really wonky ways, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I would say that PKD is kind of like Bellardian in that sense, too. And exactly. That, like it's science fiction but it's not about like the far off future it's about the near future and it very much mirrors like things that are going on <clears> today <throat> like i thought exactly. that uh, mood machines were like really neat it's kind of like uh all these like mood altering drugs that like doctors might prescribe you if you're depressed or something you know uh they'll yeah. put you on prozac and kind of give you a false sense of not happiness exactly but it just like blocks off your ability to feel any real emotion but like mood enhancers and stuff like that like and i do think it's safe to say that's what he was like alluding to with the mood machines and stuff so like though it is science fiction it's not like total fantasy it is like still rooted in reality and uh yeah it's more of concern with the near future like the first uh blade runner movie takes place in the 2020s which yeah you know Clearly, things have not turned out exactly like that, but I mean, cybernetics and AI are kind of hot topics right now, too, though. So, like, it is prophetic in a way. Um, 
Yeah, and, and even that, like the way the way we sort of approach technology, like like let's be frank here, the average person is not gonna go and engage in some space opera adventure. This isn't Star Wars, this isn't doing the the average person, they go to work, hang out with their friends, come come home. In in my humble opinion, we live very tableau lives and by tableau i mean life is almost like a series of of uh, stage sets it's almost like a silent movie we have this disembodied camera that kind of looks at us i.e our phone we're in our room we're at work we're in the kitchen whatever and philip kd's books are a lot like that there's no grand like chase through a street there's no space battle there's people alienated people engaging with technology either around the kitchen table in their living room or on a spaceship somewhere so in that sense philip kd um pkd sorry is uh is, is very much a uh approachable author it's like a lot of people could put themselves in the shoes of uh Descartes. and same thing when you watch the movie blade runner there's no like yeah there's that there's a scene <clears throat> in which harrison ford chases the android through uh the streets and the battle at the end with roy batty but generally speaking the character of uh, rick deckard it's very much uh, a film noir that takes place on, on on the down low you know yeah i did want to bring that up like i guess this is a good way to segue into uh the ridley scott movie from 1982. um when i first watched this movie i was still like a kid and like i was a big star wars fan when i was a kid yeah. and it's got like harrison ford in it you know han solo so like i was expecting it to be like this action-packed popcorn flick and like yeah. the first time i watched it i thought it was really boring like because like it, it wasn't what i expected it to be but then i like re-watched it a little older a little more mature and i loved it like the movie is visually stunning every frame of the movie is brilliant like that opening with like the eyeball and uh, it's looking out on the cityscape and you can see the reflection and then the camera pans in and like flies in on the city and it's just, like just this oppressively bleak atmosphere you know flames are coming out of the smokestacks it's like a great fucking intro to the movie it really sets the mood and uh yeah but it's not at all like uh um like uh an action-packed popcorn flick at all like it's more like a neo-noir art film really um yeah it's very exactly. visually stylish and very visually conscious but yeah and like other pkd um transitions from like pkd stories to movies like are the exact opposite like total recall or something is very much an action flick with arnold schwarzenegger yeah. um but yeah, like this deals with a lot of the same subject matter as Total Recall or um, Terminator even. That's not based on PKD, but, uh, you know, it covers, a, like it's basically, like not the same story, but it covers a lot of similar territory. Like Blade Runner really could be approached that way, but Ridley Scott's style just did not, he didn't go that way with it. It's more like an art film. Um, well, exactly. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're you're 100 right. But even to touch on to touch upon Terminator, yeah, you could tell Terminator was really inspired by that general like neo noir aesthetic that Ridley Scott went went for when adapting uh, P, uh, PKD's work. But having a movie like Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep becoming Blade Runner, having that become a more of an action-based movie, I think would take away from the spirit of PKD because this was a guy who never really left America. Yeah, he, he may have gone to, he, well, he went to France like uh, on the eve of his death where he gave that very schizophrenic laden speech to a bunch of French sci-fi fans whom I will give the people from France credit. It's because of them that his works exist in their entirety because the Europeans understood where Philip K. Dick was coming from. But even him, he lived a like a life that was very American. Yeah, he went to Vancouver once on like a drug tender, but that's <laughs> it. So, so turning his works into these like cinematic spectacles with like chases would kind of take away from the general spirit. That's why I don't get upset that Ridley Scott took some liberties of the subject matter, 
but I'm happy that Ridley Scott really kept his characters grounded. They're not like they're not real heroes per se. They're they're more like um oh they're literally noir detectives. They're like a, a lone cowboy. Yeah, yeah. Um I thought Harrison Ford's performance was really good too. Like it was really like low key. He doesn't actually have a lot of dialogue. Like there's some, but like yeah, I don't know. It's like it's hard to put your finger on. It's very unique. There there have been like other movies that came out in the nineties, like Dark City comes to mind. Yeah. Where, like clearly it owes a debt of inspiration to Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. And that it is like a neo noir film. It's been a while since I've seen that, so I don't want to talk too much about Dark City, but hmm. the comparison is definitely there for those who want to see it. Um yeah. Um Anything else about uh, Ridley Scott's rendition? I'm sure there's lots more. I'm just like, I don't have notes or anything. We're just kind of freestyling this. Um, well, anything well else you uh, to... I don't know. Let's see uh, what uh, our friend has to say. Uh, <laughs> me and you are just jabbering the whole time. All right. Uh, Jackson, have you seen the Ridley Scott film? Um, I've seen the, two, the 2049 one. I don't know who made that. Uh, Denis yeah. Villeneuve. Yeah, he's a, he's a Canadian filmmaker. The the, uh, no, the new one a, a very Canadian movie because it's got a Canadian director and star. Uh, Ryan Gosling is from Ontario, so where I grew up. Um, yeah, we'll get into that. Um, personally, I like uh, Ridley Scott's movie better. So uh, if you haven't seen it. You really should. I think it's like a cinematic masterpiece. Every time I watch it, I like it more. Like, um, like I said, the first time I watched it, I was like a kid and I was expecting Star Wars and that's not what it was at all. The second time I watched it, I was about 18 or something. And like, I appreciated it a lot more. Um, the pacing of it is like, it's a two hour movie, but like it kind of flies by, um, which that would be like my main criticism of the newer one. I did think it was yeah. over long. Um, it was still like a great movie, but the Ridley Scott one, it just like pulls me in. And like, I wasn't looking at like how much time is left every five minutes or something. Like it kind of just washed over me and yeah, it was an immersive experience. And like, yeah, I watched it again. I think, I think it was the third time I watched it for uh, this podcast and uh yeah i liked it even more than the last time and i picked up on all kinds of things i missed the first time let's talk about deckard a bit um yeah because it is an important difference between uh the uh 1982 version and the newer one um in the 1982 version it's only kind of hinted at at times that like deckard might be a replicant like it doesn't explain itself. It leaves it kind of open-ended and mysterious, which I liked. Whereas in the newer version, Deckard is just a replicant and like the filmmaker has made that decision for you. Um, yeah, that actually piss, uh, really pissed me off to be honest there. Because in the sequel, on the one hand, all the Blade Runner fans, we were like, this was a worthy sequel. It was a sequel done with the fans in mind. But concerning Deckard, being like they highly allude to him being a, re a replicant that kind of like kills the mystique because movies are fun when you could talk about them for decades on end and and no one has a right answer a good example is john carpenter's the thing one of my favorite horror movies we don't know who's assimilated and people could literally get into online 4chan level spurg fests over this but now, since the question is kind of answered, maybe yes, no, it, it kind of like ruins it a bit, I find, you know? Yeah, no, I would agree with that 100%. Um, yeah, it's like, uh, shit, I had a uh, a comparison there, but I, it has escaped my memory. Um, where was I going with that? Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Um, let's not dwell on it. Um, yeah um but i also felt that the sequel i don't know if this is just me nit, uh, nitpicking but i felt like it was kind of um two movies in one let's say like on the one hand like it starts off like wow this is a real tableau-esque movie a real noir like the like like case journey to case journey through this 
even more hellish world, right? And he is an android. Uh, and then he has that uh, relationship with his uh, holographic, uh, his uh, holographic wife who there, played by Anna de Armas. And that relationship, that's something I thought should have been explored more. I would have loved to watch them be the entire movie. But then it kind of veers off into wannabe American action territory when he goes into like the wasteland area. Yeah, I, I felt I felt that was like no, no. I'd rather focus on this burgeoning uh, love story. Then there's this underground resistance, and I'm like, oh god, it feels like a wannabe mature young adult novel that doesn't go anywhere. So I was like, so I left the movie not with a bitter taste in my mouth, more like my eyes rolled, but Denis Villeneuve delivered enough to satisfy me, but not enough for me to want to be a big uh, 34 year old boomer and buy the physical copy. <laughs> yeah. Um, as far as like the relationship between Ryan Gosling and uh, Anna de Armas's character, um, like again, it goes back to like the Ballardian near future um, aspect yeah. of it. Like he's clearly talking about incel culture and like porn addiction and stuff. Like he's in love with this hologram, and like in order yeah. to have sex with the prostitute, like like the hologram has to merge with the prostitute or whatever. <laughs> um, which again, like it's like something that's like a very hot topic and people talk about a lot right now and it's clearly what it's alluding to but it's using science fiction to basically talk about current trends um like yeah you know, it's not totally fantastical um go ahead about about ballard there uh, there's a scene in uh, blade runner 2049 in which k visits the ruins of vegas right and this is really i'm pretty sure this is inspired by the scene in androids where deckard f following uh, his execution of the five or six um androids he um takes a little he goes into like exile for about like a day or two in the wasteland of oregon which in this time is just an atomic blasted hellhole and i think that was inspired by what PKD wrote at the end of the Androids book. But going back to Vegas, <clears throat> there's a scene in which he sees a malfunctioning um, hologram of, uh, it, it, it's uh, Sinatra, right? Yeah. 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 <clears throat> I have a feeling that whomever helped, helped write 2049 may have been inspired by the Ballard book, uh, Hello America. It's one of Ballard's lesser works. It's the only work and rushing to paradise that i found boring that had more potential but there's a lot of really large holograms and it is partially in vegas so i'm convinced there was a ballard fan writing the last half or helping to write <laughs> the last half of that movie and this idea of large holograms being um projected um in the in the, in the sky is something advertisers are talking about now so that's a nice little tidbit i decided to throw in yeah, the the newer movie also like go back to cyberpunk. It's more self consciously a cyberpunk film. It doesn't have yeah. like the neo noir uh, feel to it that the original one has. It feels not to say like the cinematography isn't brilliant and it isn't a very visually stunning film, but like the aesthetic is different. It doesn't have like Emma Darmus isn't really a um, she's not a femme fatale the same way Rachel is. Um, yeah, exactly. And it's See, about I holograms, like um, and virtual realities and stuff. Which that's what I mean when I say like it's more self-consciously a cyberpunk film yeah. because cyberpunk is like a solidified genre now. Whereas when PKT wrote his book, it didn't really exist yet. When the movie came out, it didn't really exist yet. It was like an important precursor to that style, and definitely. Cyberpunk was a huge influence, but yeah, the newer one's more self-consciously about cyberpunk. Yeah, like I would have enjoyed having Anna de Armas's character be completely fleshed out, right? <clears throat> like just have her have like a growing relationship with Kay and she gains fuller consciousness. But, you know, it's maybe in an alternate universe, this version of Blade Runner exists. In a way, I'm also, I'm sad, but I'm also a little bit relieved because the last thing I need is to have Twitter be full of incels turning Anna de Armas' character into everybody's favorite uh, online GF. We already have <laughs> enough of that crap, so no, I'm good.
No, yeah, the the video of this is just gonna be uh giant naked Anna de Armas uh yeah. the whole time. By the way, <laughs> I, I'm joking. It's, it's gonna cover both films, and yeah. yeah, there's a lot of visuals to work with. Like I found a lot of stuff on Telegram that different channels put together. So I'm looking forward to. I think the video is gonna look good. Not that I'm a great like video maker by any stretch. I basically just yeah. make slideshows. But yeah, there's a lot of good artwork that I'm going to be using and stills from the movie. Um, yeah, I'm going to get into who, who do you guys like better, Anna Darmus or Rachel? I don't know who the actress is off the top of my head. but uh, uh, Oh, fuck. I forget the actress's name. I think her career, the, the actress in the first, oh God, I feel like a loser now. I should know. Um, I know that her career tanked in the late 80s because she got involved in a with a Weinstein s character, and I think Weinstein may have derailed her career because he engaged in sexual advances towards her. Uh, but yeah, she's no longer an A lister. I don't. I don't think she has. I don't yeah. think she's done anything in like a decade or something. Yeah, like I don't. She doesn't look familiar from too many other movies. Um, you know, I kind of just know her as Rachel from Blade. Runner. Yeah, but like, she everybody does a great just knows her as Rachel. Um, yeah. No, I'm oh, probably going to use uh, Rachel. Oh, Sean Young. Uh, Sean Young, that's her name. Sean Young? Yeah. Well, yeah. What else was she in? I'm, like, looking it up now. <clears throat> American actor. All right. Let's see. Yeah. Filmography. She's still in movies. Um, I haven't heard of it. She's in like TV shows and stuff. Um, she yeah. was in Ace Ventura, apparently. Stripes with Bill Murray. No way with Kevin Costner. I haven't seen these movies. They like they look like eighties tees. You know, I saw Ace Ventura, obviously. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Anyway, for like curious minds, it's not that important to Blade yeah, Runner that's itself. It. So. But yeah, but, she did a great job. Um, Anna Darmus was good too. Um, you know, and that's that's kind of become iconic for like Gen Z. Like it, exactly. it's very much the newer movies very much made for. Um, yeah, it, there's a lot of Gen Z anxiety in that movie. I find. What do you and, mean? And that? it has resonated. Um, maybe uh, Jackson Jackson's the only Gen Zer on the uh, panel right now, but. Uh, I don't know. Like, would you say that's accurate? Like, um, like the newer Blade Runner movie really, um, like Gen Zers like really identify with the movie and Ryan Gosling's Gosling's character, or yeah, especially if like if you go on TikTok, which I don't use it, but I have a lot of friends that send me stuff that like you can see a lot of like people making edits of Ryan Gosling in the film. A lot of people talk about how he's he's literally them. And I yeah, think oh also God. probably. Probably like one of the most relatable things about Cyberpunk. I mean, um, Blade Runner for my generation is probably the hypersexuality portion of it, because my generation grew up directly with the internet, and and a lot of us had unrestricted internet access. So you probably can see where that leads to. Mm -hmm. There and is also, definitely I think that, a, lo a lot of sexual hangups that I picked up on <laughs> the extremely online ones that I interact with. Um, but that's a, that's a story for a different episode. But I think the hypersexuality of Blade Runner is, is extremely fascinating. Like, I, I think that deserves its own, like, like essay or, like, podcast episode. Just talk about the sexuality of Blade Runner because there's so much to it. No, no, yeah. man. Go on. Because, like, I see, like, <clears throat> the sexuality, the hypersexuality of Blade Runner reminds me so much of, like, st late stage capitalism with, like, Mark Fisher and Nick Land where, like, mm -hmm. at the point of capitalism where, like, you know, historically we've always had prostitution. We've always had, a, the Romans had, the Greeks had it. Every civilization has had some one form of prostitution, but I think what makes late stage capitalism's prostitution very unique is its overly sexual, on demand, consumerist aspect. Because back in the days, you had to like go on the street, you had to walk around New York City at night to go find a prostitute. But, like in Blade Runner, if you want, like if you want, to, if you want to fuck or anything, you can just like get a hologram, go find a prostitute, like go outside your door, order one, order one, and stuff like that. And so it it presents sexuality as like something almost come it's like commodified sexuality where like sexuality no longer has like anything sacred like batai would talk about or like even a traditionalist would talk about it's like it becomes so insanely commodified to the point where it's on demand low budget it becomes fast food and, and blade runner 
Yeah, yeah, no, you're absolutely right Right about that. And also, my own little two cents about this. I haven't read Mark Fisher, although his book is on my Amazon wish list. I should seriously read it. But it's funny because you get the rise of the online e-girl, which we see them on Instagram. We've all clicked. And they always have a link page. And imagine my shock. They're going to have an OnlyFans or something. Or if they have, like, a, like Twitch or something, they're dressed up with, like, cat ears. It's like really, really <laughs> Funnily enough, I actually do play League of Legends with, with a lot of e-girls. Like I'm on their streams and everything. It's kind of funny. Are you serious? <laughs> no, like dead ass. No, dead ass. I met these two girls on League of Legends. They invited me to their Discord, and now I play League with them when they stream. It's kind of funny. Oh wow! Uh, no, but, no, but but I was also uh, gonna say that. Look, it, it's funny because I know some uh, economic thinkers, be they on the radical right or on the left, like Mark Fisher, they talk about like. Everything has become commodified. You could only enjoy yourself or have a hobby if you could make it into a business venture. Or why are you doing so and so? You can't make money off that guy. Don't waste your time. So it's funny. Like women have become empowered, but uh, through their empowerment, some of them have gone a step further. And instead of becoming a doctor, lawyer, teacher, nurse, whatever, they'll just become a a like sex worker, but not even a physical sex worker, i.e. doing actual physical pornography. No, they'll be in their room live streaming. And in turn, they turn themselves into a digital object. They bitched and moaned for like generations. We don't want to be objects in the house, but you in turn turn yourself into a digital object whose nudes could be leaked i.e you've become you're you're becoming a bunch of pixels basically in kind of this I, weird way i think that's like my issue with like liberal feminism because like when i always talk about feminism i always preface by saying that i am 100 percent support of angela davis sadie plant xeno feminism and marxist feminism 100 okay. percent pro that but i think the biggest issue of like modern feminism like popular feminism is that like it's idea of like women empowerment is literally just capitalist empowerment. It's like, it's not like actual human empowerment. Like you would read from Nietzsche or like from like Henry Bergson's vitalism or even Plato. It's not like actual human empowerment. It's more like empowering and adjusting yourself to a capitalist system in that your sense of value and worth as a woman is nowadays defined more in capitalist social relations. Okay. That's 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 a little bit over uh, over my my uh, pay grade, but I get it. Yeah, um, yeah. Like as far as women's lib goes, um, and the sexual revolution of the sixties, they like there were opportunists like Hugh Hefner or what have you who kind of like capitalized off that, and in a weird way, did kind of end up reobjectifying women in a different way instead of the. Uh, Instead of the housewife or what have you, it becomes the uh, sex sex kitten or what you yeah. know what I'm getting at, you know. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they're still commodified. Um, I'm not like a feminist like that, so it's like um, I don't really think about it too much. But uh, yeah, it's it's definitely a theme of the newer Blade Runner movie that wasn't really present in the uh, Ridley Scott one. Um, well, but yeah. Let's... Go ahead. <laughs> well, about that, uh, in the original novel, uh, the character Rachel, towards the end, this is actually this is actually two themes in one when you think about it. Because Rachel, she's being she's described in the book as being, well, well, she's described as being well. Deckard is very sexually attracted to her, but he has to kind of fight his urges because she is an android. But she's very feminine, but feminine to the point in which certain of her attributes seem a little bit younger than she would than she's kind of designed to be so there's a tad bit of a creep factor but not so much but she also has sex with deckard and then she spills the beans that uh, she only does this with other bounty hunters as a way of them lowering their guard so they have empathy with a robot and so not kill her and this theme of having sex with uh, basically machines is very prevalent in the original novel. There's the character, another bound, a bounty hunter, that Rick Deckard thinks is an android called Resh. He is a normal guy, but before he kills female androids, he has sex with them, then just pops them off. 
Uh, and then Record is shocked by this. He's like, how could you do that? So they give Raj the Void Comp test and he passes it. He's a human, albeit a human that's a borderline sociopath, but still a human. So this idea of like sexualization, well, this general theme of sex and machinery and the digital mind, that was more prevalent in the work by PKD than it was in the two film adaptations. Yeah. Interesting. Um... Let's talk about the uh, robots themselves and the replicants and the revolt against uh, their creators. There yeah. are obviously a lot of illusions that could be made, like Frankenstein comes to mind. It's kind of a trope in science fiction and uh, horror of like the mad scientist whose creation turns against him or what have you. Rutger Howard, uh, Rutger Howard rather, is great and. Um, the original Blade Runner movie. Um, oh yeah, he's awesome. And, and yeah, they're, they're like, that's what I'm getting at is like these robots are, people talk about automated labor all the time now. And it's like, <clears throat> the thing with Blade Runner is you really sympathize with these characters and these like robots, but like we're basically setting them up as like this new slave class or whatever. Um, you know, the film, Blade Runner does a great job of like humanizing them and making you sympathize with them. But it's like, yeah, they're not even human. And like, they are probably going to be taking over vast swaths of the workforce in the near future. Um, <clears throat> are you guys worried about like some kind of like robot revolt against the humans and they don't need us anymore? So, absolutely you know, not. Well, yeah, I'm I not worried well, about it either. But I think go ahead. that. I you know I think that like you know I'm a computer science student so I kind of have I kind of do have some do have some leeway with this is that like you know having taking classes next year on actual like how to how to make that type of shit where like robots are like making legitimate like AIs and stuff and robots that do shit for humans I I don't think that a robot revolt would happen per se because I think that ultimately it depends on the humans who are creating them on what that's going to even do because like if you if you create a robot if you create a robot to create other robots and you tell it what to do like you program it to do certain things then well if you if you like you know have some human create a robot to, to program other robots to kill humans well then like you're fucked but if you just have like humans program other robots to program to just do human tasks then i really don't see the don't i really don't think any robot revolt's going to happen and I'm also extremely skeptical of so-called sentient AI just because of how they gather data from the internet. I'm very skeptical. Yeah. People will talk about sentient AI. And I think that robots in the workforce and I is a good idea. And I 100% support replacing menial labor. Like, obviously, this would be like another socialist society in my, my view. It would be very good for like fast food workers, factory workers, and stuff like that. Like Having robots replace them would do yeah. more good society less workplace injuries more free time and stuff like that and i think that like a lot of like the anxiety around ai and robots comes from a luddite perspective like a truly luddite one especially like you see with like artists on twitter and stuff like that that it's it's very reminiscent of like what jackson lu talks about in the technological society with technique or like what tekinzinski talks about in technological slavery yeah yeah like um, uh, cause, like meant like meant, like meant like jumping off from what you said before like the, like a lot of fear comes from a luddite perspective i think you're absolutely right because me, well first things first m mostly boomers and gen xers are scared of this this comes from a hefty diet of really terrible sci-fi movies uh when it comes to all oh, the fear of robots whatever but the thing about uh, the up and coming robotics revolution or AI revolution and the phasing out of menial labor, I think I think that's great because let's be real. No one wants to be in their 40s being forced to work a fast food job that's very monotonous and and doesn't pay well. So jobs like that, you're absolutely right, will become a thing of the past when it becomes completely automated. And who knows, maybe certain certain professions in the uh, medical sector will be aided with AI. So I think I, th I think that's great, and I think we another jumping off point is general human labor. Like human beings, there's a difference between labor and work. Like creating a beautiful statue, that's work. Um, having a hobby that you manipulate stuff and make a thing, that's a type of work. 
So people like work. Humans are not lazy. They enjoy working and doing things. So having AI and robots uh, in general will free us to work on our own terms, will free us so we don't have to labor and grind and live the monotonous boomer lifestyle, which is you toil away for little to no money for someone else's pocket, you know? Yeah. Um... I th yeah, I think that's like... Going off of that, it's like one of my biggest issues with ant with the anti tech movement and basic luddism is in the self is that like I read I've read a good majority of all of tech and Sensei's works and Jack Salu, and like I fundamentally do agree that like as technology has been currently, it's been pretty disastrous in the hands of capitalists and in the hands of corporations, and I think that Tech and Sensei and Jack Salu make extremely good or make valid points. Like I disagree with them on the fundamental like outcome, but they they are clearly smart people making extremely valid points but i think the issue with, with both of them and just in our general anti-tech is that like this idea of like the, the resistance to technology because it overcomes the human is fundamentally a liberal humanist idea mm -hmm. and also i think that um it's very reactionary because like they want you know like tech and Zinsky is a primitivist and he wants to go back to primitive societies well even that's debated but he wants to go back to a time before te technology overcame like factories and mass industrialization like that and i think the issue with that is that like it creates more labor issues because it doesn't liberate humans from labor it just goes back to a time we were even more enslaved by our own labor people like, yeah no exactly with, like people look back with rose-colored glasses too um and they're like really just ignoring like how shitty life was like you know back then like you know you'd be shoveling cow shit and shit all day you yeah. know nobody like, like wants to do that like i'm fine with letting a robot do that shit like exactly you know, like, dude dude, dude, like, dude you're 100 percent right i was actually trying to find a segue into this that a lot of ludditism if that's even a word kind of ducktails a little with the sort of rose tinted glasses you mentioned about old school work like oh, look let's be frank america oh, sorry the united states is the global or rather western hegemon they more or less kind of set the standard and a lot of lamestream conservatives fetishize <laughs> Gr grinding they fetishize breaking your body and busting your joints to to holy hell as you like hoe up an entire field oh look at all the sweat i sweated i, I worked so hard for my grain and i built a house from like brick and i'm like dude you're 55 your body is shattered to shit you have yeah you built a house but you're broken good job you built a house that's fantastic but having a robot help you do that you could do so much more this doesn't take away from your ethos as a man frankly it just shows that you're a man working alongside a robot that will help you and you'll live longer and a happier life there's nothing wrong with that so my two cents about this whole thing is a lot of ludditeism kind of fishtails with the rose tinted glasses the older generations have of toil and there's nothing enjoyable about toil toil and work are two completely different things I think Would that, you like, guys say that? Oh, go ahead, uh, Jackson. Yeah, I think that, like, going off that, I think that, like, I do agree with them that, like, life had more meaning back then because, like, obviously, like, there's a lot of nihilism nowadays and, like, people felt more satisfaction from their work. But the only reason they really felt satisfaction from the work and labor they did, from the labor they did, was because, like, they needed to do it to survive. So, of course, when you're done doing it, you feel a bit of satisfaction of, like, okay, my feudal lord is not going to fucking murder me. He's not going to, like, rape my wife. Or if you're, like, a caveman, it's like, okay, I'm not going to fucking die. I'm not going to starve. Like, of course, you would feel satisfaction with that. But I think that, like, also, a lot of, like, the Luddites miss, especially, like, especially, like, John Zerzan. Like, John Zerzan is a good example of this. That, like, it's also just, like, the whole entire, like, frankly kind of racist idea of like a noble savage that like oh people, right. the we were like oh so good back then like we were primitive man like quote primitive man like i i hate i fundamentally disagree with all the terminology about ideas of primitive humans and stuff like that i think it's completely yeah. bullshit and i, I think I that went through my I, I went through my primi phase in like my early 20s and i definitely read zerzan during that era and yeah he talks about the like the noble savage and how much better things were in the like the primitive world and like yeah you have more time for play um you know people didn't work 40 hours a week or more than that even um and you know they 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 had everything they needed but it's like 
like the fundamental idea is like if progress is a good thing i think it's just inevitable it's how things evolve and like you can't really just go back to this like ideal state and just put things on pause like if you did bring down industrial society or industrial civilization it's only a matter of time for it to like re reassert itself and you know come back around it's just how our societies develop like, i mean that goes like that goes like to like nick land and like accelerations of the idea of like like tech like technology is, is, is exponentially always accelerating it's going faster and faster and faster and that like primitive models are of no use because you just literally cannot stop the march of capitalism technology from a lens of like like the tie and acceleration <laughs> i did i did want to talk about nick land a bit too because like when i was uh watching or re-watching the um original blade runner movie more so than the like the newer one um i couldn't help but think like keep thinking of that line like neo china arrives from the future and yeah. like the the corporations are more powerful than the governments it's like this is the future nick land wants um i was thinking about <laughs> that a lot like do you agree i guess you haven't seen the uh, original blade runner movie well from but, what you're uh, describing well i've read like i've read a lot of nick land's work and he, re he references blade runner sometimes and i think that it's yeah. a misappropriation to say like he like okay if we're talking about like back then like fang no and land he he definitely didn't want corporations to control he like being government powerful because back then he was not a neo reactionary he was very much so a mark he was not a, he was a marxist in the strangest sense of like he was um, like a post marxist yeah like post marxist and post left type guy who was like extremely unique with his ideology he he back then moreover was just like more of it's like descriptive of like yeah this is probably what's going to happen because capitalism inevitably feels technology technological growth and he ultimately supported de-regularization de of capital like 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 Deng Xiaoping's reforms are like probably like Nick Land, Nick Land back then really liked because of the idea of like letting capital flow using Deleuze and Guattari's analysis of like the body without organs being capital like that's definitely what he wanted was capital to go go more and more and more because then it'll cause more technological growth destroy old society and create something new from the ashes of <clears throat> old society but his newer work definitely is very much so of like supporting like a corporate state not like a fascist corporate state but like a legitimate like jeff bezos type shit. yeah which I'm not really too keen on. I mean, we're seeing <laughs> what Elon, not. Elon Musk is doing with Twitter. And like, I don't like the woke left either, but it's like Elon Musk is just as bad. He's not like supporting free speech at all. You know, he's kicking certain people. It's, it's more of a right wing bias than there used to be, but like the far right is still going to get like banned. I mean, and so are the far left. Like, trying to think we're recently kicked off Twitter um so like from day one he's being kicking people I, I don't think we ever got ff ever got shadow banned before uh musk took over uh, and i think it's funny that like accounts are, a lot of our accounts are like complaining about this like which i do think just inevitably comes with the right word drift like you know the right is fundamentally hostile to the arts in my opinion they always have no, been. See, an artistic I, expression unless it like reinforces their values or yes exactly or like anything too spicy or adventurous like you know i mean i, I mean like I really also like i think it's funny that one nick land has disavowed elon musk on twitter as being like realizing how shitty it is to actually let some let, let some capitalist dickhead run a major social media outlet but also too if like the point about right-wing art i think it's like that I do kind of I do kind of agree with you can especially see with the national socialist movement where like they will appropriate art only if it fits their values and it's not even like transgressive art at all like <laughs> like if you look at the art of Nazi for, Germany for none sure of it was transgressive Nazis, for sure with the Nazis but also mm -hmm. just like the religious right and shit like oh you know, yeah they have the, the video nasties in the UK the satanic panic uh you know where they're burning heavy metal records and shit um, you know, like they don't like artistic expression. They have like a long tradition of doing this, but like, because the left are kind of more dominant on like social media and shit, like they used to run these companies and still kind of do like the Twitter thing is the Twitter thing, but, uh, they've been like experiencing a lot of censorship over the past <clears throat> couple decades that they didn't used to, but like when they were in a more assertive position, 
as far as the culture goes, they were totally repressive and like they weren't free speech advocates at all. So it's like, I don't really feel sorry for them for like getting kicked for saying the N word on social media. Like that's really what free speech platforms turn into. You can go to Gab and it's just the fucking sewer. Like you don't want exactly. to talk to the people on there and that's who free speech platforms inevitably become for. Like the only people who benefit from it are like obnoxious trolls who want to say edgy things online. Like edgy, like, like 15 year olds who think it's cool to say the N word and that it's so transgressive yeah. to just like say racial slurs. When like, in and reality, it's never, not that. They would never repeat this shit in real life either. No, no, literally they like, wouldn't. Consequences like, for it. Like, like no, like straight yeah, up. I yeah, I don't feel sorry for them. People like my like recent right wing cancel culture article, people were saying I'm like, indistinguishable from like a liberal or something but that's bullshit. i mean yeah like I, I don't really care about that like i do get that you know people think progress and they think progressive liberalism i am an advocate for progress and artistic expression and shit these are kind of like classical liberal uh notions but uh yeah mm -hmm. the right is definitely not in favor of that neither is the woke left um you know they're just as repressive and i get into trouble with those people too but uh yeah I don't, i'm not sure where i was going with that but well well i just want to add in my two cents concerning uh right wing and left wing art we've agreed numerous times about you know whoever is in power will always try to stifle whatever alternative artistic expression arises that you are absolutely right but my biggest concern is like many people online they try to sort of like paint sort of right wingers as being anti-art across the board i will say sorry to any americans that listen but american right wingers are horrendous when it comes to artistic expression <laughs> yeah. it's, so, it's, it's, it's very it's very bland very focused now there is a time and place for focus art don't get it don't get me wrong but if you look at quote-unquote conservatives in the uk i mean like the old school <clears throat> people like like one of my favorite authors uh tolkien for example he never called himself a right winger he would always describe himself as as believing in a, con a non-constitutional monarchy and and anarchism he hated most politicians and in a letter to one of his fans he said he he would not mind lining up most politicians against the wall left and right he hated the nazi party but he had a soft spot for franco with spain because he was a very devoutly catholic but to sort of paint all right wingers as being unartistic is actually wrong even looking at uh, salvador dali my favorite painter the man lived in franco with spain and was drawing like melting naked bodies and clocks and nothing really happened to him. But to hammer home the point, yes, you're absolutely right. The 4chan dwelling Spurg National Socialist that fetishized the most boringest uh, art movements around, yeah, that's, they're, they're pretty bad. Yeah, I mean, Julius Avola started out as a Dadaist. Exactly, um, yeah. You have the futurists, you, awesome. you have guys like Ezra Pound, like, yeah, there were a lot of like important artists of the right or who like progressively went towards the right as their careers developed, like Dolly. Um, like, they're all modernists, like, who are the like the important right wing art figures who are like actually trad? I think like only Arno Brecker really comes to mind, yeah. Well. I don't know. I don't know the political persuasion of Frank Frazetta, but I, I, I sometimes I get I get the impression I have no idea where he stood. But I wouldn't be surprised if Frank Frazetta was a was a rightist. I don't know. I have to double check about that. Yeah, I think it's Lundle interesting how like CA also is definitely like he was like far far right, but he's mm -hmm. his, like artwork is very <clears throat> very modern, um, and his architecture. Um, but yeah, like the this whole like fascism or third positionism as this inherently traditionalist thing is just like it it's needs bullshit. to stop. Like it wasn't the case at all. No, like look yeah. at the look at um, the the Italian futurists. Like in 1919, when uh, when the Mussolini and his black shirts sort of drew up their first uh, fascist manifesto. It was them, uh, uh, the futurist, uh, uh, stu uh, members of uh, the various student unions, peasants, and a few nationalist liberals. Literally, there was no trad fags ar uh, around, 
uh, or even allowed and no aristocrats either. So this idea that like a radical or slightly nationalist or explicitly nationalist movement uh, needs to basically be sort of like hamstrung by traditionalist art in which everybody is painting bowls of fruit is is crazy. I think it's also interesting, like if like it comes to like Julius Evola and his art. First of all, I love his paintings. His paintings are absolutely stunning to me. But also, mm -hmm. I think like the idea of like fascism not being progressive or like being like a cult of tradition, like Umbrento Echo says, is like pretty stupid considering the fact that like. Julius Evola, probably the most right wing person I've ever lived of so yeah. this earth, insanely traditionalist, defending the Indian caste system, even like oh, Jesus boy. Christ. <laughs> yeah, if you if you read Revolt Against the Modern World, he actually is support of the caste. But anywho, it's very interesting how like modern day liberals or even some people on the left will say that like all oh, fascism is very traditional when like Mussolini was persecuting Julius Evola during the time of fascist Italy and even yeah, afterwards. Yeah, he called like, him a spur. Like some neo fascist like in Italy, like Franco Freda and other people were a fan of Evola, but Evola wasn't much of a fan of them. And even in Ride mm -hmm. the Tiger, he told people to basically abandon politics. It's stupid. I'm just fed up. Fascism didn't work. Communism bad. Liberalism bad. Just focus on yourself type shit. Yeah, yeah, like one thing I like about Evola, I tried to read his work, but sometimes I, it, it turns into uh, intellectual spaghetti, in my opinion, because I like my <laughs> philosophy. I like my philosophy to be like well, extremely laconic. Get straight to the point. I want to be a man of action. Let's see what you could say. I don't care. You could be a, an extreme psycho. Just pull it all out. Stop pulling punches. That's how I like my my philosophers, right? But um, about the, about Evola, one thing I really really liked is what Jonathan Bowden had to say. And yes, John, Jonathan Bowden is not perfect, but he does bring up a few good points when it comes to uh, aristocratic uh, sports let's say like uh, evola was a huge fan of fencing boxing wrestling and mountain climbing really like singular sports maybe you'll do it with a second person let's say and it kind of goes against the grain of this bourgeois uh modern uh, sensibility that as i've mentioned before oh you have to do something if there's a profit margin oh don't do that it's dangerous you climb a mountain because it's there you know and if people say, well, this sport doesn't uh, relate to the lower classes or, 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 or the teeming masses, Evola would just very slyly lay back and say, it doesn't concern them. Who cares? I, I would say, like, I would push back and say skateboarding is a very working class sport that does, yes, like, sir. You know, independence but it, and, like, you know, uh, but it is. And, you but know, you could you're say, doing, you're doing now this would be big. You're doing it with your friends. There is a social aspect to it too, but it is. But, an but you're also sport. being an individual because it's it's you, the board, and the ramp, right? So yeah, you could. Yes, you are right. It is a working class sport. But I would say I would take it a step further. Maybe you're a, a quote unquote blue collar aristocrat because you're doing it on your own. Even me, sometimes in the summertime, I'll take a walk around the neighborhood. And I'll see I'll see kids going nuts on their skateboards. This is completely individuals being free. You know what I mean? It's yeah. fun, yeah. I, I skate during the summer and I love it. It's absolutely a blast. Yeah, I, I used to skate growing up and I had a lot of fun doing it. I don't skate anymore because I'm an old man and my knees ain't what they used to be. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, like for me, it was my, I never got good at skateboarding. Like it was a, uh, it was more the social aspect of it. It was something to do with my friends. We were too young to get into bars and shit. So Find a quiet parking lot, skate with your friends, smoke a blunt, drink a 40, whatever. You know, that was kind of like yeah. my youth. Good times. Anyway, we should get back to Blade Runner, though. Like, uh, would you guys say, like, Blade Runner is pro-tech or anti-tech? I, I think it's like, it's not like it doesn't have Marinetti's optimism for the future. It makes the future look pretty bleak. and uh, It's a chaotic neutral. It, it like depends on your interpretation of it. I I personally yeah. think. Well, going back to the book, I, I think when it comes to a question like that, we have to look at PKD's kind of relation to tech. He he never really said tech was bad per se. His biggest concern was people's empathy in relation to a technology, because a theme that's in the book that 
kind of comes through in the movie, but not quite, is the idea of empathy. And that's where the void comp test comes in, because you're asked questions that will allow your irises to expand or contract or measure your heart rate, whatever, based on the empathetic level of your answers, right? But in the book, they take it one step further and they sort of put the sexual aspect, like I mentioned before, or this idea that, oh, does Rick Decker, does he really want to execute this android? They seem so human. And then you get the character of Isidore, I'll whom, by the what? Wait, did, did, did Jackson just leave? No, no, go, go ahead. Oh. Okay, yeah, anyway, this character, anyway, so this uh, this is going to go all over the place, but when it comes to the optimism of, of technology, like, PKD basically just had this issue that uh, technology, does it make you more empathetic or less? So... In the in the book, that question is answered. I think it's kind of up in the air, base, uh, basically, because it's like, yeah, the androids are really human-like, but people treat them with literally no empathy at all. They're just workhorses to work on these off-world colonies. But then you have a character like Rick Deckard who kind of wrestles like, oh, no, do I want to kill kill this android? He seems so, so lifelike. Wait a minute, am I an android? So he kind of wrestles with how he's able to do his job, right? Then there's the character of Isidore, who in the book is called a chicken head because he's genetically slightly fucked because he's been exposed to nuclear radiation. So he works um, as, at a uh, veterinary's office fixing android animals. And when he eventually meets the android Pris, he feels more of an affinity to them because they're persecuted, similar to him, who is constantly de de degraded and uh, attacked for being genetically effed up, right? So to answer your question, I would say it's clearly interpretation. No one knows if PKD was um, pro or against technology. <clears throat> yeah, I would say like, yeah, he does a lot to uh, humanize robots and make you empathize with them. Um, and yeah, but like I would say like, it's overall kind of a bleak thing like, Science fiction movies in like the 50s and the 60s were very optimistic about the future and it was all very utopian. And in the 70s and 80s, it took a very dark turn and people became yeah. very pessimistic about the future. And like to tie it all together, like Mark Fisher talks about this a lot uh, of like lost futures. Um, people no longer believe in the future. They're very pessimistic about it, um, which explains why like, there's, so, there's so many trad bags on the right and shit now, because that optimism for the future no longer exists. Um, I mean, it's also like people they're... talking about progress and stuff for like progressive liberals and uh, which, you know, a lot of like normal people are, find off-putting the stuff they're talking about the kind of progress they're promoting it's not really yeah, about don't... high tech anymore it's um it's just pregnant men yeah also with like um mark fisher's lost futures i think it's also important to, to talk about um there jack there does hauntology and how mark fisher uses it when it comes mm -hmm. to the idea of like we are we literally just like we have not had any culture development since like the fucking 80s except maybe 90s of grunge of Kurt Cobain. Even Mark Fisher notes that like Kurt Cobain was like, what the fuck is even happening? We're not making anything new. There's no new culture, no counterculture, no nothing. And that it, you can see this and you can see this even in Blade Runner where like, you know, it's supposed to look all futuristic. But like, to be completely honest with you guys, I don't really see like the aesthetics just look like something you see from an 80s sci fi movie or 90s. Like there's nothing new, like nothing like created. Oh, no, you're yeah. absolutely right. But to sort of um, build off uh, what, what you said about the Mark Fisher, which I've actually heard elsewhere, uh, now I'm starting to get the impression that there's since there's no big overriding culture, like nothing new and fresh that everybody of all age groups can more or less latch on to, I'm starting to notice there's more of a prevalence of various sub uh, subcultures completely disconnected from each other. 
like like you'll have a group of people like i really like techno music so me and my friends will gravitate towards that where there's a lot of change a lot of evolution whatever then there's other people they like classic rock they're gonna go there then there's other people that are really into literature and they go down the literature tube uh, rabbit hole on youtube so i'm starting to notice i don't know if you if you guys agree that culture now is really like atomized into little cu uh, uh, cubby holes what do you guys uh, think yeah it's definitely yeah. ghettoized and people <clears throat> like people just kind of like find the people who are kind of interested in the things they're into online yeah. and like you don't get a lot of overlap between these groups like i mean i kind of see it even in... like my i kind of see it in like my university and stuff of like because i'm like if i'm if i'm pretty sure I, i'm pretty sure about this i'm the only philosophy student who is a computer science student as well and also I'm taking English classes soon and I'm taking classics classes and stuff like that. I noticed that like a lot of people in universities today, especially like you can even say there's a cultural stuff guys are talking about where like they only stick to one idea subject field and only that. And they think there's like no interaction between other fields, like say the interaction between philosophy and computer science, computer science and biotechnology, or like the interaction of music and um, even like oh, fucking government and stuff like that like it's very weird how like i see like i'm not calling out people on my college specifically because i like my i like everyone there but i'm just saying that like if like, i like in the culture thing like you can see people who only focus on one thing and ignore other things and think that there's no like interaction or or interconnectivity which is kind of bullshit considering that like i personally think probably because my spinoza probably because of spinoza that like every single thing is interconnected and that in order and that when you focus on literature but you don't focus on politics, don't focus on art, you don't focus on technology or anything else. It's like you're missing a big picture. No, no, mm -hmm. no, you're absolutely right, right about that. Because I, rec I recently had um, a discussion with a friend of mine about modern day education, specifically uh, younger, gen younger members of uh, Gen Z, way, way younger than you, and members of the upcoming Generation Alpha. Like, like when I was in elementary school, the teachers, it would be very common that the English teacher would even be the geography teacher or the uh, I know we had a, a gym teacher that was teaching us ecology also or a math teacher would even do let's say uh, sociology let's say nowadays we live in a world of this neoliberal economic paradigm that really sort of stresses sort of specialization but to 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 the extreme like a math teacher is only a math teacher a french teacher is only a french teacher <clears throat> it's not like it's not like it was in the 50s or 40s or 30s in which the priests catholic priests specifically jesuits would be teachers and they could talk about a wide range of topics like a geography uh, teacher who was a priest could even do a little bit of math a little bit of science or even uh read the books by uh proust or uh, chesterton nowadays we live in a world of such extreme specialization no one's really well-rounded anymore or rather like you have the younger generation that they go into the world <clears throat> having anxiety about not knowing stuff they should have picked up just by osmosis just by being around people you know i think that like you're what you're talking about with, like the idea of like the teacher doing all the stuff and the priest the jesuit and stuff like that this is like really ties good to like cyberpunk and especially like jill deleuze and felix Gattari's anti-oedipus duology mm -hmm. because like you can really see this in the idea of deterritorialization and re-territorialization with capitalism and the body without organs that like people like as capitalism progresses we become more of like post fordism or like the assembly machine where like you're specialized to one part of the economy and only that and you can yeah. see this in like deleuze and Gattari where they talk about how like you know there's people instead of like having someone go like especially like they talk about this with the um, the case of judge schraber and like the schizophrenic out for a walk is a better model than the 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 the, the, the fucking person on the couch in the analyst's room it's like this mm -hmm. idea of that like instead of going out in the world and experiencing everything becoming like feel like becoming round rounded enjoying every aspect of life doing everything you could possibly like not doing everything you can do but like doing everything that just legitimately interests you no matter what even if it doesn't interact with a certain field it's kind of dead nowadays because like it's yeah. everyone everyone wants to be a special specialist in only one thing nothing else only specialize in one one thing can't focus on anything else like i've been criticized numerous times by my musician peers and throughout my years that like that I focus too much on other instruments just because I want to learn every instrument. Yeah, which, yeah, yeah. Which no. I don't I, think is weird. 
No, no, dude. There's nothing weird weird about that at all. I'm I'm yeah. kind of the same thing myself. Like like um in the in the Telegram chat, me and you have uh, have spoken about this that I studied to be a college teacher. I wanted to teach at the CJEP level in uh, in my hometown of uh, Montreal, right? So yeah, I got my MA degree in classics. I love talking about the ancient world. I could talk to it ad nauseum. My bookshelf is full of that stuff. But the way the world is, they uh, favor part-time teachers. So I became an electrician. Yeah, I'm making almost double or even triple in some in some cases. And I still meet people They're like, oh, you wasted your time. Oh, what? I'm like, dude, I came back with a minor profit. Like I consider myself a lifelong learner. I'm intellectually curious. So, yeah, I'll spend $50 <clears throat> on books on Amazon. It won't net me any money, but it'll make me happy. And now I'm just at the point in which, hey, I'm reading this big fat book about the Roman Tetrarchy. Why? Because fuck you. That's why. I just want to. And there's, <laughs> I, and there's nothing wrong with telling people <laughs> to fuck off. I just want to. Yeah, and I also think that like, I'll probably write about this at some point. I think it's like a de like I call this like a degeneration, the Nietzschean sense, like decadence, not like some stupid right wing degeneracy shit. But Yo, I God. think that like modern modern education has become degenerate in a sense of like it's degenerated from a good idea of like the well-rounded person or even like even the liberal arts nowadays are like pretty degenerate in the sense of that like people only get liberal arts degrees tech degrees or anything like that because of profit like like i wanted to go to school for philosophy because i like it i i don't care if i don't get a fucking job with it i don't intend to because i i know i fucking won't i'm going for computer science because i like money and also i do and actually enjoy computers and like working technology mm -hmm. and planned economies, the you know, AI. Like so many of my peers, you go up to someone in college asking, why are you doing your degree? Money, 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 money. Exactly. Instead of, instead of like the idea of like learning because for the sake of learning, doing it for the sake of doing it because you love it and you love life, it becomes truly decadent in the Nietzschean sense of like, they only do it because they just need money. They just need that. They, they don't, really care about it they don't care if they're miserable at their job like business majors are a good example of this where like they'll they'll like also i'm not I'm not talking about anyone in my college if my university here is my professors hear this because my professors like futurism forever but uh <laughs> but um amazing but you can see this on like a lot of like people go to like business or stem where like they they don't actually have an interest in business they're only doing it because money and like yeah, they're they only miserable. do it because they they watch too many Gary Vaynerchuk videos, man. Yeah, and and it's like they're miserable. They're miserable. Like yeah. I truly, I truly feel bad for these people because like they they're always only focused about money. And they're only stressed about economy and stuff. They only stressed about stocks. They only stressed about how to make their employer happy or climb a corporate ladder. Like it's like American psycho type shit. Like it's just, <laughs> it's just really sad. Like I truly do feel bad for these people. Like I I I would hate to be like I would hate to end up like that. And you want to know what you just did right now? You inadvertently segued right back to Philip K. Dick because for a second I was like, oh shit, <laughs> it's going all over the place, which let's be real. These are the best conversations. We'll start with something, then I'll segue to some other intellectual province. But all, what you all, said all about- All episodes are kind of like that. Like, yeah. The, the but... subject is kind of the starting point. The conversation can go wherever it goes. So. Um, yeah, yeah, but what Jackson mentioned about money, people do stuff for money, they do stuff for status. This could segue <laughs> right back to Philip K. Dick, because in his original book of Androids, the reason Rick Deckard even takes on the commission to retire the Nexus 6 androids, yes, there is money involved, but specifically, there's status involved. He doesn't do it because he likes it. He doesn't do it because it's his job. He doesn't do it because, oh, he's a bounty hunter for the force of San Francisco. No, he does it because he's going to get enough money so he could buy himself a real animal because him and his wife currently own an electric sheep. They and their neighbor who they're super jealous of, but they try to keep it on the down low. And I think their neighbor knows his neighbor owns a real organic horse that eats real organic grass. And so Rick Deckert, he lives in that kind of ideological world Jackson is, men is, is mentioning. He does his job so he could gain more status and basically flex on his neighbors because he has uh, well, desires to get a real animal, any animal, even if it's like a toad, which appears at the end. So that's a nice little segue. It's interesting. Indeed, indeed. Um, yeah, I think um, 
we're gonna get to like final thoughts on Blade Runner and start wrapping it up. We've been going for almost a half an hour, so we got a good podcast here, I think. Um, yeah, man. And you, anyone have final thoughts? Wh- which movie did you guys like better, or like which adaptation? The book, the nineteen eighty two movie, or the most recent one? I've only seen the most recent one, so I can't really. I'm, I'm not a liberty to say, but I'm definitely going to read Philip K. Dick after this. Oh, go for it, man. Yeah, I re- I read the book years ago. But I started reading it for the episode, but I didn't get through it all. So like I'm, uh, I I want to read it from cover to cover <clears throat> again. But between the movies, like I personally like the uh, 1982 version better. Like I think it's a brilliant film. It's one of the greatest movies ever made. Every frame of the movie is uh, like beautiful to look at. Um, it's a very visually rich movie. Um, and uh, there's just a vibe that with that you won't find anywhere else. It's not like your usual science fiction action movie, as I've already said. Um, it's more of an art film um, with a brain. Um, there is a lot of depth to it, and we probably could talk for hours about this and go in all kinds of directions. But I think we've covered a lot of ground already. Um, we uh, talked about yeah. Nick Wayne and Mark Fisher. We've talked about film noir we talked about becoming ai techno capital uh revolt <laughs> of the machines um just talking shit um but yeah uh, um, but by the way just one last thing uh before i give in my last uh, two cents here uh, i i think jackson you, i heard in your voice you may have been a little bit confused of what i meant about sheep and horses before you read Philip Wall, you're going to see this in a book if you eventually decide, decide, decide to read it. Uh, in this world by PKD, um, most animals on Earth have become extinct. So that's why he wants to get an, okay. an animal so badly. Because I kind of I gathered that from the intro to Devlin yeah. 2049 because of like the, yeah. the eat the bugs, live in a pod scene. Yeah, versus, exactly. Like, growing yeah. Bugs. And I was like, yeah. what the fuck are they growing bugs? And I'm like, oh, it, I don't really see any does come animals. Up in, it, it does come up in the movies like it's a lot more central to the book like the yeah. animals thing like having a uh, a real animal is uh like it's a prized possession it's like a status, it's a status symbol. symbol yeah but and like but it con- comes up in the movies with like that stripper lady or whatever with the snake, the snake and like yeah harrison ford asks if it's real and he's like do i look like i can afford a real snake like and also like uh deckard's character in um the newer one, he's got the dog, and like Ryan Gosling asks him if it's real. Um, they don't really like it's a lot more central to the book. You would have had to like read the book to pick up on that. He doesn't know if it's real. Um, I, I think he's at the point where he no longer cares. Um, <laughs> but but the yeah. concerning myself, yeah, I'm gonna side with Gio on this one. The uh, the first movie is a uh, is you can't touch it, it's unassailable, but specifically the proper cut we have now that ridley scott intended yeah it's it's a visual it's it's more of a visual masterpiece in my humble opinion because it's a feast for uh the eyes uh but i still fantasize about maybe one day somebody will decide to make a netflix adaptation of the novel in its purest form that we could explore all these random threads but i doubt that really highly on on that netflix thing um <clears throat> i kind of wanted to say this at the end there is netflix made a really good adaptation like well, that's not even that's just got an original series cyberpunk 20 cyberpunk edge runners and okay. i think that like if, if you like blade, blade runner it's a it's an anime oh, yes, like, i heard about that yes dude it's so fucking good like if you like blade really? runner you're gonna really like edge runners like, like no, I, but pers- of, personally but i think edge runners, server. oh sorry I, I think personally no, edge no, no. runners is also like extremely futurist like actually futurist because you know there's a lot of like like marinetti's random machines where like people like coming integrated machines um people love drugs and shit there's a lot of hyper violence a lot of like sexuality people like there's so much violence in the film tons of shootouts car chases it's very anti-capitalist and it's very like clearly like meant to like piss people off and shit no but the thing about like modern day anime is yes i like 
And yes, I'm going to sound like a Spurg and a nerd. Yes, I like manga and I like anime, but I prefer my anime to be more on the animated level of, let's say, Akira or Hayao Miyazaki, because or or the classic Dragon Ball that I that I ended up growing up with. Like I noticed the uh, the series you're talking about. I saw a few screenshots. the The animation seems very angular and, and a little bit too sharp. I don't know if it's just my old boomer eyes adjusting. I have no idea. Well, I mean, I personally like that style, and I mean, I've watched a lot of anime. Like, I love Cowboy Bebop. I've seen Evangelion. Oh, so if you mm-hmm. like Akira, you're gonna definitely love Head Trenders, dude. It's so incredible. Oh, really? okay. Yeah, yeah. And also, like, another one suggestion I have for like, viewers, or just like, I have an like, idea for another podcast episode, probably like talking about Edge Runners and this anime called Vivi, Florida's favorite song, which is literally mm-hmm. a whole anime about what happens with sentient AIs and like, is it a future where basically 100 years in the future, every AI goes rogue and like legit, like legit kills everyone, like goes like absolutely cruel. It's pretty shocking imagery. And it goes back in time to tell this girl who's a robot to like, hey, stop AI evolution from happening. And it's a very interesting show, in my opinion, about that just really talks about um, like the implications of having artificial intelligence, AI relations and like like transhumanism. Like I, I really do think you guys would really like that show. Nice, nice. I'll, uh, I'll uh, definitely look into it. Yeah, I'm kind of like on the anti anime tip, but it's more because like when I see somebody with uh, an anime girl for a profile picture on okay. Twitter or whatever, like they're always just like really undesirable people. Um, yeah, I, the K, I wish the I could K on profile pictures are actually worst. look like. I think about that video game guy from South Park who's like morbidly obese and has oh, yeah, 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 yeah. his hand brace. Smells horrible. But his hand brace. <laughs> I'm a grumpy old boomer, though. I'm not actually like that closed minded. Um, you know, <laughs> like I do like Akira. I do like this Studio Ghibli movies. Porco Rosso is one of my favorite yeah. movies. We should do an episode on Porco Rosso, to be honest. But uh, that that's an episode for another day. I love that movie. But uh, and yeah, I grew up on Sailor Moon and Dragon Ball Z and shit. Hell yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not that close minded. I just like making fun of anime fags because they're an easy target and they're almost always like act like absolute scumbags. So, yeah, if if you want to get in like Geo's good graces, a good way to start is not to have an anime girl for your profile picture. I hate that <laughs> shit. And like, I'm judging you. Uh, before you even open your mouth, it's not even fair. Um, you know, but, you know uh, it's with it's with this in mind. It's with this in mind. Next time I'm driving home from work, I drive down this major artery called Sherbrooke Street, right? Almost every second day, I always see this. I think he's an anime spurg. It's this guy with this big Viking beard, but he, I, I kid you not, he has these pink headphones with pink cat ears. I'm like, if there's traffic, <laughs> I'm taking, <laughs> I'm taking a picture um, and sending it to you guys. I, so I've been, I've been funny story. It I, I have those exact headphones because I got my friend to buy them for me as a joke because she had two hundred dollars in Razor gift cards, and she wanted to spend some on me for some reason and so i said oh buy me these these pink um cat ear headphones and then she actually did so, um, oh it's probably it's, it's probably it's probably it's probably the same model that guy has yeah it's pink and like has flashing lights and stuff yeah i know what you're talking about oh my god but he walks around as if he's like yeah this is my world you guys are just living in it fags i'm like oh my god i'm in the car i'm like no one's looking at this uh <laughs> Anyway, you know what says about note, cars. Yeah. <laughs> on on that note, I think that's a good place to wrap up. Um, yeah. Thanks for listening, guys. And uh, hopefully we'll be getting podcasts out more regularly soon. Um, I'm still dealing with my thing. Um, housing is an issue in my city. And uh, it's hard to find places to live that are affordable. But we got one out finally. It's been two months since the last one. We'll continue to do them regularly until I'm able to do them more full time again. But uh, to the loyal FF speed tards, uh, thanks for your continued support. And uh, hopefully it doesn't take two months to get the next one out again. But uh, yeah, salute. Thanks for listening. I thought this was a good podcast. So yeah, it was great. It was fun.